Today we're looking to install some upgrades on our workstation. What sort of upgrades? Well, we're going to take this workstation, the HP Z8 G4, and give it a quick CPU upgrade, which by definition makes this a CPU upgrade guide. That's right, we're going to take some dual Xeons, we're going to check out some thermal paste application methods, and take note this is the Skylake and Cascade Lake Xeons, like the 6142 that I've got here. And stay tuned for a future video where we test out thermal paste application methods, but for this one, we're going to be focused on getting these dual CPUs installed into this particular workstation, including things like the ideal torque wrench, which CPU coolers we require for this particular socket. And we're even going to look at a little bit of benching. Check a related video for more information on this particular workstation. But for now, we have so much to look forward to from thermal application, benching, the whole process outlined in detail for your viewing pleasure, so you can get your machine set up. Now what do we need? Isopropyl alcohol, dual CPUs, a torque screwdriver, Thermal paste, I'm going to use Cryonaut from Thermal Grizzly, but wait, experience has taught me that at this point we probably should do a very important thing, which is BIOS update. That's right, if you don't update your BIOS, there is a risk that your new CPUs will not detect, so we'll call it future proofing. Step one, go to HP's website in this case, find your BIOS update. In my case, when I was doing this update, 0.294 revision A, using HP's little download assistant, let's get this BIOS upgrade started. It's actually really straightforward. We'll follow through all these prompts and then it installs. It is going to restart the machine. It is quite a delicate process. Make sure you don't have any power cuts during this as well. Very, very important. And uh, once we've got this installed, I mean, then we can do our upgrade. Okay, there it is. We've got to do update. Take note, you could do some other upgrades there as well, but we'll just go for the USB update and take note that does mean you need a USB for this to install upon. Now that the files have copied across, we're going to expect the machine to do a quick restart, and this is where you have to implement patience. I'm not joking, it makes you a little bit nervous when it powers on and powers off several times, but there it is, we've done our primary flash. Now it probably needs to reboot several times, and this is where you just stand around nervously looking at the machine, hoping that it's not bricked, and yeah, look, look at that, it's uh, telling me to wait patiently. See, see, it says there, be patient. Now, as we nervously wait, step five is a cliffhanger uh, to be continued later. Now, I need to quickly pause there because I need to show you this digital screwdriver. So, a quick screwdriver recommendation. This is the Vanpo Digital Torque Screwdriver. Now, why would we need a digital torque screwdriver? Well, turns out these CPUs require a very fine instrumental amount of torque to secure them. And take note, it's not a torque wrench. Supplied with 10 S2 magnetic bits, quite handy for most applications. And there's the fine details there, we'll get to that in a second, let's quickly get this unpacked. There it is. Beautiful looking, uh, sorry cameraman, can you zoom in for us? Oh that's excellent, look at that, beautiful. So we got memory, wake from sleep state, and even units. Now take note, the ideal torque range is somewhere between 0.3 to 6 newton meters, sorry I run on newton meters. And uh... Take note, it is battery powered, which is going to be a nice little feature. But for now, we need to quickly get this set up so we can launch in. Now, there is one little limitation here. We can't actually use this to get access to the T30 bits on our CPU cooler. But it's okay, I've got a fix for that. Now, these particular S2 extension bits will definitely do the job. Yours don't need to be rusted like mine are. They've been in the garage for a while. Very handy for that application. But here it is, with a little extension, we can actually get these to connect up using our digital torque range. Sorry, cameraman, thank you, perfect. Okay, just like that, look at this, easy. Definitely check that out. I've got the product description, affiliate links, of course, in the description below, so check that out. Now, first things first, we do need a screwdriver in order to assemble the screw. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, assemble the screwdriver. It's okay, they do supply one, but I've used my own in this case. Now, with our batteries connected, take note, two AAA batteries. We just re-secure it, and uh, we're ready to go. We can now do whatever we need to get those CPUs installed. So, very important, you will need a digital torque wrench, and I'll show you a little trick very shortly as well. But now, just before we launch in, Take note, you should probably measure your grip strength. Now I'm going to say this is mandatory, just so you can sort of get a feel for the torque range, make sure it's working, 
and check the accuracy. I'm sure you know exactly how strong you are, and you can compare this relative to your actual readout. So that's not too bad. It feels pretty reasonable. Good amount of talk. Okay, let's go for it. We want to see how to install these CPUs. Now, the first place to go would obviously be Intel's website. So checking the details, it is a T30 Torx screw, very important. And there's the metric there. We need 12 inch pounds. Oh, they got a video here. We should watch that as, oh, we can't see it. It's too small. Anyway, I'll just show you how to do it. We don't need Intel's help. Now, very important, on these particular coolers for the LGA3647, we might need a Stanley blade. I know that's uh, non-standard equipment here, but it's actually some annoying glue that got stuck on the copper plate. So it's okay, a little bit of Stanley blade, maybe a little bit of scoring, hopefully not too bad. Now for the torque wrench. Now, I'm going to actually try and measure how much torque was present. Take note of the pattern on these. We do have to follow a very precise removal process. So we don't end up warping the CPU. So used to warping the head on a cylinder block, but this is a whole different ball game. But same rules apply. We've got to follow the pattern, otherwise we can cause damage. Now I'm actually going to try and measure the torque, and you'll notice here, it's not quite where it's meant to be. I don't know how accurate it is doing this on the loosening process. We're ending up around 3 inch pounds. I mean, that's nowhere near 12. So that's kind of curious. The last, oh, that one wasn't too bad. That was about 7. But generally, these are meant to be or upper 12 inch pounds. Does make me wonder if the previous person who installed these didn't use a torque screwdriver. It's okay, we forgive you. But this is really important. That's why you need the digital torque screwdriver. Gives you nice, adequate pressure on these CPUs. And there it is. Very easy. One simple fan connection. Take note of that. And there it is. This is the magic. Very important. Check out the golden triangle. That's going to help us to realign, in this case, the cooler the carrier, as well as the CPU socket itself. So that's kind of technical, and this uh, carrier is quite a tedious little thing. But this is our new, oh my goodness, look at this. I got some dirt in the CPU paste. Now take note, the stock cooler actually gets supplied with a really nice thermal paste. Uh, it's okay, a little bit of scoring, that's fine. We are going to put it up against Cryonaut. This is from Thermal Grizzly. And this is just me getting nervous over that socket. It's okay, let's cover the open socket with a bit of a cover or a bit of a panel just in case we drop some thermal paste in there that'd be really really tough to get out and we'll save that for a future video but quickly removing the ram take note i will do a future video on how to upgrade the ram on this particular system but i feel like it's pretty self-explanatory you can kind of see what we're doing here already really straightforward but definitely stay tuned for that future video ram upgrade guide for this particular machine that should be a fun one as well now, why am I removing the RAM? Well, I was actually going to do an upgrade. So you don't need to remove the RAM for this upgrade. So yeah, you can ignore that part. Let's launch in to removing the CPU from the carrier. Now, this bit's actually quite tricky. It took me a little while to figure out how to remove it. So ended up using a little flathead screwdriver here, or a Torx head in this case. Flathead's probably better advice. That, yeah, that's better. See, that's what I recommended. So gentle prying you'll notice it kind of latches around the cooler be very gentle here because i feel like if you break one of these you're going to be in a world of pain kind of maybe not you might actually survive without it as well i did try that on at least one occasion uh, so don't recommend it but it can happen and there it is it's not looking too bad we can see an immense amount of thermal paste run out probably not surprising but it still actually looks half decent we have uh, pretty good coverage now using isopropyl alcohol, we can quickly clear this off and we need some precision instruments. Ooh, um, those are not just ice cream sticks, they're precision instruments. Now this will allow us to scrape off the thermal paste without scoring up our copper heatsink in this case. So yeah, it could be worth investing in some sticks, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Now once we've cleared this off, the tap is not mandatory, but it is kind of helpful. We just give it a gentle uh, a tap there, it just helps to get some of the debris out. Now this is the magic, really cool features. Check out the thermal connectivity, 12.5 watts per meter Kelvin, which is really just a fancy way of saying it's able to handle a lot of heat. Thank goodness for that. It's also not electrically conductive, which is another huge bonus. It does spread relatively easy as well, but more on that in a mere moment. Now this is the most optimal thermal application method on the internet that you have never heard of. I'm gonna call it the initial method. See what I did there? Initial method. There it is. Uh, yes, this is it. You must use your initials and then you have the most optimal thermal paste application. It's easy. And then you just spread. That's right. You must use the spreader method. 
I've seen a lot of YouTube videos on the topic, so much so it's inspired me to try and make my own version of thermal paste application methods. So stay tuned for that. We'll do some proper testing on this in the future to finally decide what is the best me method. But for now, I'm going to say it's the initials plus spreader method. Yeah, but you get the idea. It doesn't really matter too much, does it? We'll test it. But for now, this is our cooler. Check out the part numbers in the description here. We must obtain the correct pair of coolers. They are different between the two sockets. Very important detail. You can't just use the same cooler for both. Trust me, I tried. It does not work. Now, to finish off, we add five little dots due to the surface area. And that's going to help prevent air pockets. Actually, quite an important feature. Now, these carriers are really important as well. If your machine doesn't have the carriers, you're going to have to get some. I will have a link in the description. They are kind of tricky to find. Make sure you've got the right carrier for your application. Very, very important. Now, installation is really simple. Now, I am a little bit curious to check out what these uh, old CPUs were. Another key detail, always check for thermal paste underneath the CPU. You'll see a future video where I actually show you what happens when you get thermal paste embedded in there. And another key point, if you are selling these, always clear off the thermal paste for the person Otherwise you just create a mess, like now, I've got to go through and check for thermal paste, it's horrible. But anyway, this one wasn't too bad, so well done. Okay, now for fitment. We have to watch out for these two little tabs that hook on or latch on to our CPU. At this point, it is meant to be secured, but call me overly cautious, I feel like I don't fully trust it to keep that CPU in place. So I always keep a little bit of pressure there, just in case it decides to fall out of that socket. That'd be really annoying. Can you imagine the damage that would happen to this poor little CPU if it fell? So very important, keep a little hand there. Now, isopropyl alcohol, give it one final de-dust, de just to make sure it's nice and clean. And then we can mate it to our cooler, which has hopefully not picked up any dust while we were cleaning this off. There it is. Now, very easy for installation. There is one very important thing to keep an eye out for. It actually caught me off guard. I was about to install it, but then I noticed the... CPU had a little bit of clearance there, just didn't look quite flush or square. So it turns out you've got to watch very carefully for these. I imagine this is why I've seen posts where people say they've cracked these CPUs. If that's not sitting flush, you're going to be in a world of pain. So definitely do a visual inspection after installation. Just clips in, very easy. Make sure you keep an eye out for those golden triangles. You can't really go wrong. Now let's have a look at these uh, original CPUs. I bet they were some seriously powerful CPUs given that this is the HP ZA G4 workstation. They're the very, very impressive Silver 4108. Whoa, no, that's not very impressive. A core? Who put an A core in these? It's okay, that is probably the wimpiest CPU out there for this system. But very, very important, there are better CPUs out there. You can totally spec this out with anything that you would like just about massive number of cores or even some very high clock speeds now for the magic now i'm actually going to slightly under talk call me overly cautious yet again because i don't want to crack one of these cpus i've read a fair bit about that so very important check the order for the talking super super important depending on the digital talk screwdriver that you're using you're gonna have to check the talk very carefully it's a very delicate process but in my case, all done. Listen for the clicks, very, very important. Oh, uh, key detail there, make sure you plug the fan in before you install the CPU, otherwise, word of pain, you gotta remove it and that's just awkward. Next CPU, obviously we're running at a very high pace here, but same process. Now, I do believe the carrier might be slightly different or maybe my carrier was uh, not perfectly matched. I had some trouble with carriers, I had to buy multiple in fact. But make sure the carrier works. Keynote, can you install these without a carrier? I'm not sure I can say I'd advise it, but it is technically possible. I've actually pulled this off. It can be done, but it's not pretty. It's high risk. You could drop the CPU, so I definitely recommend finding the appropriate carrier for your cooler. And uh, here's our second cooler right now. This is going to be CPU 1 on the Z8. Again, checking for flush fitment once it's installed to make sure we don't have any problems. And obviously using the spreader method, don't forget thermal paste. I will point out that one of these CPUs has the stock thermal paste. The other one has thermal grizzly, giving us the opportunity for a unique test. Oh, thermal paste all over the place. Make sure you don't get any of that onto your system, but let's check this out. Thermal grizzly versus the stock thermal paste. There's our fan connection. We've got our golden triangle. 
definitely important to align those, otherwise we're going to set this up incorrectly. Now just as I go to install this, I'm keen for a bit of a wire rerouting. Why would I want to reroute it? Well, the cable tension was a bit tight. So you may want to take a look at that. The fan connection, probably better suited to route this on the other side. Don't know if this is a factory thing. If it is, I'd recommend rerouting. That's much better. Closer to the target always helps. Now, once we fit this particular CPU, I will point out again, probably best to first plug it in. Learned that from the first one. Once you've got the wire connected, it's way easier. Now for that digital torque screwdriver yet again be very careful when resting these on and again i'm sort of cautious that that cpu may fall off uh, from the carrier but fingers crossed it's fairly solid especially with the thermal paste a little bit of surface tension now once we've done our crisscross take note you only do one round the whole way through so set your torque wrench up 12 inch pounds is the recommended specification then we throw our ram back in which you didn't need to remove but I removed it just because I wanted to upgrade. Then we're ready. Ready for what? Well, ready for testing because we want to know, well, just how good are these two thermal paste? Oh, take note. Related video, the HP personality module. I've got a nice tutorial on how to get this into your HP Z8 G4 as well, giving you a nice rapid storage system. Now, while I take some quick photos here, I think I should point out there is a Reddit page that you should absolutely join. We also got a Discord group. So if you are keen for a little bit more connection, check out those in the description below. Now the question, does the computer still boot or if we bricked it? Are the CPUs detected? Well, there's Windows, so check, we got that done. This is the benefit of installing a BIOS update before you do your modification. It just makes sense. Very, very important. Now for the ultimate test. Does it survive 10 minutes of Sciencebench 2024? I can confirm it did, but it also didn't. Really confusing. We saw a temperature of 95 degrees, absolute peak. 10 minutes grilling at 100% usage on the stock thermal pace. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is thermal throttling. Which means our benchmark is going to be really low. And Thermal Grizzly was only a tad less, 90 degrees. Does that mean these systems don't cool very effectively? Or was Thermal Grizzly just not that great? I mean, it's only a 5 degree Celsius drop. Well, I guess you're going to have to stay tuned for a future video where we uncover all of these mysteries. But for now, there's the result with Thermal Throttling. I'm still really puzzled by that. Maybe we need to increase our fan profiles. We'll figure that out. But for now, that is the HP Z8 G4 with its fan upgrade. What do we look forward to? Well, the next upgrade is going to be a 10 gigabit NIC. Stay tuned for that one. See you on the next video.